Okay, so uh, th th I, this is a, a paper that uh, is still quite a bit work in progress. It's quite different from the paper I, I presented together with Joel this morning. It really focuses on CSR. And I guess the, 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 um, basically the idea behind this paper, the objective that I had uh, in this paper is a, a kind of, I was feeling a bit unsatisfied, let's put it this way, with the CSR literature in general. And the, the thing that was missing for me uh, was what I call here the contextualization of the notion of CSR. I, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work, uh, historical work. I, I'm a sociologist, but I, I do a lot of historical sociology. So uh, the, the historical contextualization was one missing point for me, but also the actually the, what I call the institutional con contextualization was also missing for me, and I'll try to explain what I mean here. So my objective with this paper is really to try to put contemporary CSR in perspective, and I'm trying to do that by um, um, proposing a kind of double contextualization of CSR. By double contextualization, I mean on the first hand what I do in the first part of the paper, and again, I think the paper is available somewhere in the system, I don't know where, but it's, uh, so Radu has it somewhere. Um, on the one hand, CSR, uh, I tr I'm showing in the paper, I'm trying to show in the paper, is historically and structurally uh, connected, associated with a particular form of capitalism, which I call here uh, corporate and managerial capitalism, which evolved into a neoliberal variant over the last 30 years, but was born in the US at the end of the 19th century and has become dominant in the US uh, over a period of 40 years or so, and then came to the rest of the world in different stages through the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and so CSR, you know, one argument is concretely, structurally, historically associated with this particular form of capitalism. So that's the first uh, um, contextualization that I'm doing in the paper. And second, uh, I'm, you know, uh, taking a step backward in a sense in history, and I look at um, alternatives, alternatives uh, about thinking of the relationship between business and society. Uh, so that's where the C falls, huh? it's only business and society. And some of the uh, alternatives that I explore in the p paper are paternalism, um, uh, cooperative uh, organ or, or, you know, arrangements in the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, and the welfare state, which I you know, propose as, in fact, a functional equivalent, uh, like the other models to uh, CSR. And uh, so that's what I'm trying to, uh, to do. And from there, I'm trying to show what is specific about contemporary CSR in comparison to, you know, thanks to this deco double decontextualization, I try to deconstruct the explicit and implicit political and ethical foundations of uh, contemporary CSR, trying to show how specific and different they are from uh, other forms of business society interaction. So I'll try to go as fast as I can on this. The, the first con contextualization, which is the, the connection between CSR, contemporary CSR, and a particular form of capitalism that emerge in particular historical circumstances in the US. I mean, I've, I've been writing a lot on that, so I'm going to try to summarize, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, thousand pages into one slide, so it's going to be a bit uh, difficult. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, basically, this is my, my take now on, on what I've called uh, in my early work the American model, which I'm, you know, I think uh, a bit more subtle now in trying to, to uh, define than I was at the time. And the take on, on that model is to identify actually um, six pillars of, of, of this form of capitalism, which again emerge in particular historical uh, conditions, and it would be too long to go through that, but essentially the starting point is the late 19th century. Uh, the 1890 uh, Antitrust Act is one of the big moments for the transformation of American capitalism uh, because it pro prevents cartels, it actually leads to uh, an alternative solution. Firms actually bump into uh, the Joint Stock Company Act in a number of American states as a solution to go around uh, the antitrust legislation and go on doing what they've been doing before but in another form. And the way uh, it happens is that the previously small and medium-sized firms that were connected to cartels actually merge, and that's the first merger wave in the US, into large incorporated 
firms, large corporations as we know them now. And from there, all kinds of things follow. Uh, one of the things that follow, obviously, uh, is that the uh, size of the firm increases very significantly. And we have the emergence of the large American firm as we know it, uh, and uh, as we've known it for, for quite some time. Uh, through this reconfiguration of many, most industries, we have actually the emergence of oligopolistic markets. So antitrust, yes, prevents full scale monopoly, it prevents cartels, but it actually is fine with oligopolos. And here again, there's a long history about how this happened and how this came through. Uh, the, uh, on the other hand, this merger movement leads to something which is you know, uh, essential in the uh, legal structure of the joint stock corporation, uh, which is the separation between ownership and management. And this we all know tons, you know, obviously tons of things have been written on that. First text, Berlin means in 1932 that we always refer to is, is a you know, marking point, but the problem was there for some time already. And this separation between ownership and management leads to um, one thing that is very close to our hearts because it leads to the emergence of the, of, of the profession of managers and it leads to the emergence of an entire field, which is the field of um, managers, manage, producing managers, which we belong to as a business school. Uh, this is the time when um, for example, you know, uh, the big business schools in, in the U.S. are being built, uh, emerging. This is the, the first campus, the 1927 campus of HBS. Uh, HBS was already there since the beginning of the 20th century, but that's uh, the, the day of the inauguration uh, of the campus. So we have a profound, uh, some, and something else, obviously, another very important dimension in that model is uh, the importance of the stock market and the importance of my financial markets as a whole. Uh, to the financing of this system, which comes together with the transformation of the legal structure. So we have this new form of capitalism, at the time very particular, very unique in a sense, at the global level, very, uh, and which, uh, yeah, but this is not the point here, later on after World War II in particular, came to spread across the world and came to be uh, adapted and uh, adopted and adapted in many uh, other countries, but that's another story, as I say. So this transformation is, is actually quite disruptive of a lot of things. Uh, there's a lot of political debates, uh, ethical questioning at the time in the US, etc., uh, including within the, the group of, of people who are closely involved into this process. And this is really where we start seeing um, discussions and debates about uh, the responsibility of those big firms um, and especially the size dimension starts to be really a major element of, of the, the question of uh, social responsibility. So for example, I mean something that is quite interesting is that in, in, in the dedication ceremonies of HBS, most of the debate on that day was uh, actually uh, carried on the question of what does this transform new form of capitalism imply in terms of responsibility for us uh, as future trainers, as trainers of future managers, but also for managers and for the firms that they work for? So there's a whole wealth of documents, uh, very interesting documents from uh, that very day uh, that tries to answer and deal with, with those questions. And um, while as Don Ham was uh, the uh, dean of the HBS, uh, this is just only a small extract of, uh, of the, those debates, just to, for you to, to see uh, the way it was actually being put. Unless more of our business leaders learn to exercise their powers and responsibilities with a definitely increased sense of responsibility towards other groups in the community, unless without great lapse of time there is through the initiative of such men an important socializing of business, our civilization may well head for one of its periods of decline. So this is really on, on the day of the dedication. This, this is a speech he does on, uh, in 1927. Interestingly, this is done before the crisis, before the 1929 crisis. Obviously, the 1929 crisis makes things worse on that level, really increases the issue. And so we, uh, we start, um, you know, we have a very quite a dense debate in the uh, New Deal years, we'll call them that way, uh, around uh, the size of firms and the necessary responsibility that this carries uh, towards the rest of society, 
and starting with the war and even more after the war towards the rest of the world, actually. And then we go into a, a major political evolution of the, the debate in the sense that we have to add the notion of the US as the geopolitical champion or geopolitical power holder, uh, which means that this creates another layer of responsibility for its firms in other parts of the world. So this is, for example, what we can see in the 30s. Modern large-scale industry has given to the managers of our principal corporations enormous power over the welfare of wage earners and consumers, particularly the former. Power, power over the lives of others tends to create on the part of those most worthy to exercise it a sense of responsibility. Or should we say should, uh, should create, but that's probably uh, what, what he meant. Um, some, you know, I've, I've just uh, received that, I ordered it, an old book. Uh, the, one of the very important actors of that um, development is the SED, uh, Committee for Economic Development, which was actually a group of uh, businessmen uh, created around... Um, during the period of the New Deal uh, to help uh, political leaders during that period to think about the ways in which business could help reinvent, in a sense, or itself. You know. uh, one of the kind of great sentences of the days is, let's save capitalism from the capitalists. Uh, so the, you know, the, those people, and then Howard Bowen after, after the war, but Howard Bowen to some extent, we, we know more his role in the CSR movement and much less maybe all, all those people. So there's really a very tight connection between the emergence of CSR as we know it today and the structuration of this particular form of capitalism in the US. I'll, I'll stop here on that because otherwise my friend will be upset with me. Um, the post-1960s trend, so I'll go very fast on that. We know this financialization, neoliberal globalization, uh, and the spread, the global spread, both of the model of corporate capitalism that I mentioned here to many parts of the world, and a bit later, but still, the spread of CSR, at least in, its, in this form, to other parts of uh, the world. Some of my colleagues call this uh, explicit CSR versus implicit CSR. I tend to see those things as actually not CSR. The first explicit CSR is CSR. Implicit CSR is something else, but we'll get there in a moment. In a moment. So this is uh, the kind of uh, first um, the context contextualization. I I'm not going into that because this is also connected to some of my work on governance, I reinterpret, in fact, contemporary CSR as a form of transnational governance, but this goes through a too complex thing, though I'm going to skip this. So contextualization two, which is uh, five minutes, okay. which is where I try to, uh, to actually compare this particular form of business society relations, CSR, to other uh, alternatives in history. So here in the paper, I go through a, a number of things that you probably all are a bit familiar with. Paternalism, which, uh, you know, is a tradition, a, a quite strong European tradition, although you do also have uh, an American version of it. Uh, and, okay, so we, we all are pr probably quite familiar with, uh, with paternalism as an alternative view on business society relation. Okay, so in the paper I, I try to underscore the specificities of that form and compare them to CSR. Then uh, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, I skip here the part on cooperative movements, so even though it's quite uh, important in, in the paper, but I don't have the time to go uh, through that. Towards the end of the 19th century, uh, we have, in a, in a sense, an increasing criticisms uh, that mounts against uh, the paternalist model of business society relation, particularly moved by uh, trade unions, the communist parties, and all kinds of uh, different actors around that. And, and you know, one of the alternatives that emerges, again, through many different stages, etc., is the welfare state, which, you know, when we think about it, is an alternative way to think about business society relation and has its own uh, characteristics. Okay, so um, the characteristics of the welfare state compared to paternalism, here I'm trying to compare the two, provision of welfare benefits which is detached from the real work activity and geography. And this is a bit going back some some of the discussions we had this morning about, for example, the, the, the role of, of contemporary CSR activity in, in developing countries where actually what you have is you have the creation of local pockets or geographical pockets of 
relative welfare in certain states, places of the world. Well, the welfare states project is precisely to go beyond this notion of pocket and to be uh, all encompassing, at least at the level of a society, a national state in general. Uh, a trend towards universalism, uh, that's uh, except in the US, I guess, <laughs> it's the only place where this never happened, but everywhere else that <laughs> was the trend. And a sense of solidarity that, again, will be decoupled from physical proximity. Uh, in the stories that we hear about uh, localized CSR in developing countries, we are having great, a lot of cases of physical proximity. The welfare state idea is that you actually disconnect physical pro proximity from, uh, from the solidarity and you associate the solidarity with what uh, Benedict Anderson calls an imagined community, which is the nation, the nation state. Uh, and um, the, cons the reverse consequence, in, interestingly, of the welfare state is the partial de-responsibilization of private firms and other private actors uh, in the sense that actually the transfer of responsibility, responsibility moves up uh, to uh, the level of the, of the state. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at contemporary CSR in contrast to the welfare state, because here again we have a follow-up you know, in the 60s, 70s, we have the, the reverse move in the sense where we have a weakening, uh, progressive weakening of welfare state schemes uh, uh, towards uh, uh, and an increasing power and place for CSR. What do we see? We see a partial reprivatization repri of the common good that actually brings us back a bit to the kind of paternalist model of before. Uh, the reintroduction, and that's very important, I think, and really co particularly when we think about uh, developing countries, the reintroduction of private discretionary powers in matters of social responsibility. By, what, by that I mean that actually firms can decide what is the good that they are going uh, to be working on or that they are going to pri prioritize. Uh, and this is not a political decision anymore. This is a very private, uh, uh, localized decision. Uh, another important um, element, and qu quite specific to contemporary CSR, uh, we moved from paternalism to local, that, that was really connected to the local and the um, local embeddedness, up to the national level with the welfare state. And definitely uh, what we see today with uh, C contemporary CSR is the envisioning of, of uh, the global as the ter territory of, of the responsibility of the firm. Uh, and what we see also is a progressive dematerialization and virtualization of responsibility. And this is really connected to my first part on the particular features of, of the corporation in the modern world and, and corporate capitalism. Uh, who is responsible, the global corporation, but obviously the global corporation is a very virtual <laughs> person. It is a person, uh, legally speaking, but it is a ver very virtual person, much more virtu virtual than the uh, uh, business owner of the paternalist model or even than the state of, uh, you know, of the welfare state model. And the last slide, Radu, you'll be happy to hear. <laughs> Um, uh, dematerialization and virtualization also of the targets. For whom, for what are, is their responsibility? We move with uh, contemporary CSR increasingly away from the I have responsibility to my workers, I have responsibility to my community, I have responsibility <coughs> to um, my even my shareholders, etc. Increasingly towards a responsibility to uh, the global environment to the global hu humanity or human citizen, you know, the human rights of, 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 uh, uh, of this world, etc. So there's a dematerialization and virtualization of the targets of social responsibility. Uh, arguably, but this really we can keep uh, that for discussion, a stronger importance of discourse over action. And this is, you know, a lot of uh, the debates about CSR today really s focuses on this, on, on greenwashing, etc. Uh, and this uh, very dense discourse, and this is really a very important part of contemporary CSR, the discourse around CSR is a very important part of it. And around this we have a very densely uh, structured system that reminds us of an audit society frame. So auditing, controlling, measuring, uh, etc. are all dimensions that are closely connected and are very different from previous models. Um, 
so a discuss, this discursive trend also is associated with the neutralization. This is not political decision, this is science. Uh, this is uh, the complete depolitization of, of the debate around CSR. Uh, no power, there's no power involved, we were talking about that at lunch. Uh, and the quantification in turn uh, generates a commodification of responsibility and in a sense a profound destruction of the notion as it was associated with the Enlightenment where uh, responsibility is something you cannot cut, some responsibility is something that belongs to the individual citizen uh, fully in the full sense of the term. But uh, in that uh, model what we can arguably find is that we have a complete transformation of the notion of uh, responsibility, capacity that we can actually sell polluting rights or buy polluting rights uh, is, uh, I think, a good example of that. Which, okay, that's my final point. I would argue leads to global irresponsibility or collective irresponsibility. Okay, so. Thank you.